Um, hello, thank you very much for this warm welcome. So today I'd like to talk about feature flags and what is our way uh, of using them. So imagine it's like Thursday afternoon. We, of course, we don't do deploys on Friday, right? But you deployed this new feature and everything's going good, you are tested it. And then the deploy starts, everything's good. And then you see page is slowing down, errors show up, customers start to fill the tickets, and like everything's burning. And you are, oh no, now we need to roll back. It takes like 40 minutes and is even the problem in the last deploy. So imagine you would have a magic wand and you could just in one second stop all of this. And it turns out you could have this matching event, and it could be a feature flex. So the big advantage of them is that you can switch the feature, you can enable and disable feature flag in a couple of seconds instead of deploying and rolling back the deploy. Will they save you from everything? Of course not. But they can save you a lot of troubles, and they can make it easier and safer to ship the features. Okay. So I'm Hannah. Uh, six years ago, I stumbled upon a Ruby meetup called Ruby Monsters in Zurich, mm -hmm. and that's where I learned uh, Ruby. Um, and after academic research in psychology and judgment decision making, I was teaching paragliding, and then I started to work as a software developer and eventually joined GitHub. I'm part of the code scanning team, and today I'll talk how we use the feature flags to deploy our features, and I will show it an example of a default setup. <clears throat> oh yeah, and I brought the stickers, so I even wrote it on my hand because I forgot the first two days, so if you want some cute GitHub stickers, they're down on the table. First, we will talk about uh, feature flags in general and how to use them. Then we will look at the example of the default setup from code scanning. And uh, at the end, we will discuss how to work with feature flags at scale. So now I would have a couple of questions for you. Who already knows what are feature flags? Please raise your hands. Very good. And now, uh, did you use feature flags already? Very good. And who uses them still today in their current company? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So the main advantages to being able to uh, enable or disable features uh, when you want, and they're decoupled from the deploy. Uh, you can enable feature flag either for uh, everyone, but you can also use them for testing. So you can enable them for specific actors, uh, for specific groups. For example, we often stuff ship features first, or you can do a private beta. You can enable them for percentage of users or for percentage of requests. <coughs> So feature flags are basically an if statement, right? The concept is simple. Uh, when you can make a branch with an old and new behavior. So let's have a look at like fictional feature in GitHub. We are not going to implement this. Um, but let's say that developers, they like pets. And they often have some pets and they want to showcase them to their other developer friends. So GitHub would like to implement uh, this new feature where you can, uh, next to your profile, have your pet profile. Uh, in the simplest way, you can have an if statement, like if this pet profile is enabled for user, then you, can, you want to show combined user and pet profile, otherwise you just want to show user profile, right? Easy. Uh, we use Flipper 
which is open source implementation of feature flags. And at GitHub, we have our own extension of the Flipper and our own tooling. So we would define the feature something like that. Uh, in a helper method, OK, defined, fed profile enabled. There we ask Flipper. And in our case, we often check for either actor. So uh, at the code scanning, we work for with repositories. So we often enable feature flags for repositories or for the owners of those repositories. You can also adapt this to your uh, field. We often also have the disabled feature flag. And you would think, well, isn't it the same thing? So almost. The way how we use enable disabled feature flag is, for example, we have a big group, and we want to enable this feature flag for the whole group. But you may have a specific repository or a specific person. For whatever reason, you don't want the feature flag on their part. So we enable the feature flag for the big group, and then you, with the disabled flag, you can still disable it for individual actors or repositories. <coughs> The big advantage, as I mentioned, are the safe deploy. But what do I mean with that? Big part is decoupling the deploys and the feature ships. So we put the risk, risky changes behind the feature flag. We ship them uh, features continuously. And then we can decide when we are ready, when we have tested, when we want to actually ship the feature and to whom we want to ship the feature. And again, if things go wrong, or if we need to change something, we can s in disable the feature flags in seconds. Another huge advantage is ship things in incrementally, especially having a big features. Like if you would do a feature branch, it's, it's also one of the strategies. And you would work on that over months. You can imagine that GitHub has over 1,000 developers, and the code base is pretty good. And, uh, features we are shipping at the different parts of code base, there are many of them. So it would, after a couple of months, you would have two branches. And even if you try to merge the master, right, or main, um, it's a lot of work. So uh, with feature flags, we start shipping the features incrementally. This enables us to do small PRs. Those PRs are easy to review. We can also uh, divide the code, which needs review just from our team. And that's then shipped uh, faster to domain and prepare a different PR when we know we are touching files of different teams or we have a review of specific team, for example, for API um, uh, requests. So another thing is that more people will use the same feature flag. So if you're working on the same feature, maybe your whole team works on that at some point. Maybe also other team actually need to contribute. And by having one feature flag initially, you can all ship the code where it needs to be, and uh, you don't use it, so you're safe. And the good thing is that we can also catch the potential problems in production early. Because if you plan well, you can test the individual parts before the whole feature is ready. So you can test in production under the production road with the real data. So let's have a look how to use the feature flags. I created a couple of examples. This is still like our imaginary feature. Don't wait for it. Um, so let's say that one of the biggest questions about the feature flags is uh, where to place them and how to use them. I, because of my academic background, I was kind of interested if there's a research on feature flags, so I checked some studies. There's not many of them, but uh, there are some. And um, one of the big reasons people didn't like, uh, what people didn't like about feature flags was actually removing them and that they clutter the code. And if the teams aren't diligent, then they stay there and it makes a mess. So, but if you place them wisely, you actually have way less work. So theoretically, the first idea may be, OK, this is a new line of code. I'll just put it uh, under the feature flag. But that's not what you necessarily need to do. You want to guard the new behavior. You don't want to guard all the new lines of code. So if we have our method pet details 
you can just return if the feature flags is not enabled. And all the other methods which you defined for this method will be never called. So you don't have to put each of those methods inside. Of course, this works just if you create your new methods for this feature. If you are sharing the methods uh, with other features, you have to put the feature flag inside. Uh, yes, so then if you have a other example, if you need if you have a method which already uh, existed, right? So we have a profile hash where we send some data about the user. And if the feature flag is enabled, we actually want to add the pet data to that hash. So we would just guard all the new code, and then at the end we can change the hash, and we return uh, the profile hash. If the feature flag is off, we run just the first part. If it's on, we add the um, pet data. Easy, right? So you could think, why wouldn't we just guard the part where we are merging the hash, right? Because we are interested in the, in the final result. And you, of course, can do that. But the problem with that is that that part, when we create the pet hash, is new code too. Right? And we are querying uh, the pet on a user. Of course, we could use lonely operator if the pet isn't there, but you know, maybe we just forgot. Maybe the migrations are not run. Maybe the transition of the data is not run, and users don't have data uh, about their pets. So also in that code, you may introduce some bugs, because this code will run, even though you won't use it. So you rather would want to guard the whole part. And then uh, often you also have feature flags in the views based on our new feature. If it's enabled or not, we want to show the profile differently. If you have a long view and theoretically, let's say we want to put the information about pets to many different parts. So you could do it in a way that you always go there and then you do this if else branches and you have like five of them. It's possible it works but it's way more error-prone, and for someone going to look at that code and trying to figure out what's going on, it's way harder to process that. Um, so what you could do instead is to duplicate that for a while and have one branch with a new behavior and one branch with the old behavior. This is then also easier when you're removing the feature flag. OK, you can just, you know you want to keep just the first branch, and you can delete the second one. But there is a caveat. Do you know what that can be? If the feature flags are developed for some time, if the feature is developed for some time, it often happens that some other team needs to change that view. And they're not changing just your new um, branch, they're changing the old branch. Maybe they're changing just the old branch because they didn't really think about the new one because it's not their their plan. So before you, if you use this approach, before you deploy the feature, you always want to check, OK, what are the changes in the old branch, which I'm theoretically not interested in anymore that much, but maybe there's a new code. So you want to check this before you ship the feature, but also before you will delete the feature flag. And then, uh, if you use the same method, so you want to check in a view. The first part is our view, and we want to show a different button based on the uh, feature flag. But also, we have like a component file, and we prepare the text there. So we could, again, check the feature flag. This won't work. This will work. It's like nothing bad. But you will do the same call twice, pretty much for the same thing, right? So what you can do instead, you can create a method uh, which you will use in this component, and you can even memoize the result. And like this, you can use the feature flag check in um, many places of the component, in the view, or in the component itself when you need to decide how you, how you, uh, what you do in the methods, right?
And the big, other big question is when to use the feature flags. So we aim to put all the new features uh, behind the feature flags and often also risky changes, um, risky or new bug fixes. Uh, everything which could influence performance. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Then I'm not saying you sh shouldn't do it, but what we often don't do, it's not like we use feature flag for every change which goes in the code base, right? So if the changes are small or non-risky, we often don't use a feature flag. If we are changing something which we can fully test, we also don't use a feature flag. For example, if you want to change a copy of a button or something, you can test it, you see it, it's good. And also, if we need a bug fix with which we are confident and we need to ship it right away, we may decide to, to use or not use a feature flag. Of course, this is like you need to know in your company what makes sense, but the point is you, using feature flags is useful, but it doesn't make uh, sense to put everything under a feature flag, right? So little tips from this part is when you write your test names, you usually want to test the old behavior and the new behavior, so uh, what the tests do with a feature flag on and off. If you state it clearly in a test name, uh, what is the state of the feature flag, it's way easier than to figure out uh, how the test should behave when you're removing the feature flag, or also if you can just delete it. Uh, if you can memoize the feature flag checks, this will improve the performance. And it's good, so we have many projects and many feature flags. We used to name our feature flags in a way that it's clear to which team they belong, and then also to which project they belong, and then to which feature. So now let's talk about default setup. Uh, as I mentioned, I work in a code scanning team. So what does that do? Uh, code scanning scans code for vulnerabilities. And uh, creates actionable alerts. Initially, if you wanted to set up code scanning, you had to commit file something like this. It was a YAML file we created for you as GitHub, but you still had to create a commit, create a pull request, get a review, and merge it. Um, this was a bit of a hurdle for non-technical people, and also sometimes for, you know, like you have a lot of things there. Maybe you want to understand what's going on. Even if you don't want to change anything, if you commit something to a repo, you just want to spend some time to understanding what it is. So the solution was, OK, let's make it possible to set up code scanning from the UI with a couple of clicks. And this is how we did it. So now uh, you have a UI, and you can uh, select. So the default setup is the way to uh, set up code scanning through the UI. The advanced setup will bring you back to generate the YAML file, and you can also like change the things there. And now you can select which languages you want to do, which query suite, and scan events, and then you can just enable it, and it works. So let's look at how we did get there, and how feature flex helped us to ship this feature. At the beginning, we decided to create internal API, which will be just for us to help us testing the feature, because we, we have uh, part of our code base is in Rails monolith, and we have also microservice with which we need to communicate. So we actually created the first feature flag for the internal API. Um, then we needed to uh, think about the work. Right, so there's monolith, there's microservices. What can we do in parallel, and what depends on some other work? Um, we had UI work and backend work, and at the end, to ship the first version of a default setup, I think we used three feature flags, one for the internal API, which also had changes which were required in the backend, one for the UI, and even if it's called UI, so that was about implementing the big UI part, that doesn't mean that we would have another uh, feature flag for a backend, right? Everything was done under this feature flag. And then, um, if you know GitHub, uh, we have also protected branches, and we wanted that this runs on a pull request. 
but we also wanted to run this on protected branches. So this was like part of the feature which was developed uh, at the same time under different feature flag, and then we could test it separately, and theoretically we could also ship it separately. So let's talk about testing now. First step are the tests. You want to have your unit and integration tests for both cases with feature flags on and on. Then you want to test your changes locally, or in our case, we often uh, use code space when we develop. And uh, then we have a special run in a CI where all the feature flags are enabled for that run. Because what happens, if you have tens of feature flags, everything can work well when you develop it, you tested it, great, and then you deploy it, and then someone else deploys some other feature, or they ship this other feature, and suddenly uh, things don't work. And these are actually rather hard to debug. So we have a CI for that, where we will catch this problem. If two feature flags interfere, uh, we will see that. So we need to resolve this before we can uh, merge this PR and deploy. Um, you can, as we enable feature flags for actors or repositories, uh, we can test the features in a review lab. So review web is a deploy of the, of the your current version of the application, so of my pull request, for example, but it uses the real data. It's connected to the produ production database. So it's like a step between local or code-based testing and also uh, testing in, uh, in production. And then when we are deploying, we also test in Canary. So we deploy the feature just to some percentage of the users, and we can check all the observability tools. And also, I, as a developer, I can go to the Canary and check my feature, how it actually already runs in production before it's shipped to everyone. So this brings us to the shipping of the feature. <coughs> we often first ship when we develop we enable the feature flag for us developers who work on it. Then later, we used to uh, enable the feature flag for the whole team so that people can experiment with it. Or the good thing about using your own product, like dog fooding, is that we can just test the many things just by using the software we work with every day. And that's why we are doing the second point, and that's st stuff ship. For many big features, we ship them first to all our employees, and then we collect the data, we collect their feedback, and we see if there's a problem we often find out in this stage. For some features, but not for others, uh, we use private beta ship. So we have selected group of customers who are interested in testing this out, and then because of the feature flag, we can create a special group for them, and we enable it just for them. Um, we can also do dark shipping. So as I mentioned, you can ship feature flags to percentage of people or percentage of requests. So this is called dark shipping. And the last stage is what is called GA. So when we ship the feature to everyone, it's generally available. Of course, when you're shipping this in whatever stage, if it's a, if it's a review lab, or if it's um, the, during the deploy, you want to have your observability tools set up correctly. So if something goes wrong, you want to see it. You want to see the errors, you want to see the time of the jobs, time of the requests. And often we add special logging to the feature flag so that we know, OK, maybe we ship the part of the feature. We don't want to deploy it to anyone yet. But if I enable it for myself, I see the logs that are coming from the right place where I can say, OK, this probably works as expected. And then on 9th of January, we ship the first version of the default setup. Um, this version was like, either you take it or you leave it. There was no configurability. It was easy to set up for uh, repositories who, have, uh, who had set of languages which, which we started, but it wasn't possible to um, change anything yet. And then it's time for a cleanup. Uh, as I said, many teams struggle with cleaning or not cleaning up the feature flags. So what often works well is that 
you want to remove the feature flag as soon as you know that everything's going well. In our case, it's usually from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. We have a special uh, section of long-running feature flags, but they're a different topic. What can also help you is to prepare the tests in a way uh, that you already know, OK, this is how the test should work with and without the feature flag. And when you use the good naming, you identify easily uh, which tests need to be changed or removed. You can also, when you ship the feature, you can already prepare the pull request for removing it. This can be still draft, so you need to check before removing it because the code can change. But basically, you have the feature still fresh in mind. You know where you put it. You, re uh, you understand the code. Like this, again, it's way easier to uh, go on and remove it. In general, you want to remove it from three places, from the code, from the tests, and from the tooling you're using. And uh, when I was preparing this presentation, I actually found out that at GitHub we have a script which automatically prepare, can prepare this pull request to remove the feature flag. So I can't wait to test it. And this was just the start for the default setup. So we shipped the feature. It was possible to use UI and set up uh, code scanning with a couple of clicks. But that's not where we wanted to stop. We wanted to make uh, selectable which queries we do use. We wanted to add public API to this feature. We also were adding languages, because initially we start just with the languages which had higher rate of success. And then uh, we wanted to add the functionality of selecting of the languages. You can decide which languages should be scanned. Then we moved the feature to the organizational level, because the first part was uh, setting up code scanning on a repository level. And then we wanted that the changes of the languages are detected automatically. And as uh, one of the last things, we uh, enabled to change the schedule, that you can also decide how often you want to do the code scanning. And for each of these parts, we had a different feature flag. So some of these parts of the feature we could uh, develop par in parallel, and different people, different sub-teams were working on it, not interfering with each other. Another big topic is the cross-team cooperation. If you work in your own team, things generally go easier because everyone has a shared understanding of uh, what you're doing, who's working on what, you meet the people, you talk to them. There are cases when you need to cooperate with other teams. And again, uh, for example, this was the case when implementing feature flags on the organizational scale. So we had a different team working uh, on that, but we were also helping. So we decided to go for do two different feature flags, and each team uh, was responsible for their own. And we wanted to create, the again, first the UI and also API for organizations, and so the UI feature flag was independent. The API feature flag was dependent on the UI feature flag. But what this enabled us, again, we wouldn't um, slow down the shipping of the UI if the API wouldn't be ready. And we could test it separately. So we wouldn't interfere with whatever the other team that works. And at the end, we did ship them together. Uh, but we had this option. And there was less risk involved. And these are all the changes shipped from January until now regarding the uh, code scanning. So as I mentioned, we shipped first the basic version. And with every iteration, we added more and more functionality. So just to sum it up, uh, the nice thing was that we could use feature flags in our monolith, but also in our microservices. It enabled us to work effectively and not interfere when we were working in different teams. And we use different feature flags for different parts. So again, it's easy to ship them, test them, and then to get rid of them and forget about them. And this enabled us to add more and more configurability. And now let's talk about feature flags at scale. When we started to use feature flags at GitHub, they were only available in a monolith. 
But we already have different microservices. So what the microservice had to do, it had to request, it had to ask GitHub, oh, is this feature flag actually now enabled or not? Either you could add it to a uh, request which was already used for something else, or you needed some new one. But anyway, it was not great. So then uh, we created our own tooling, and feature flags uh, are now, um, we can check the feature flags also from all our microservices, which added more complexity because not all of them are in Rails or Ruby. They're also in other languages. So they now work with different languages. Then we added caching and preloading. Um, as feature flex checks are input-output calls, we don't want to slow our applications just because we want to use feature flag. Of course, if we do many calls, it will be slower. The threshold is, OK, what's acceptable, what well not. So in our um, feature flags, we can specify in the pages and controls, we can specify, do we want to preload this feature flag for this specific view or not? So this saves us some time. When we were shipping GitHub Actions, it was a special case, because this was a feature which is being enabled for tens of thousands of users. It still, it wasn't like a, we were enabling on a customer base, so we were still adding and adding actors. And eventually, uh, it slowed down the page so much that it resulted in an incident. Um, it, the GitHub wasn't down, but it slowed down the page eventually, and we wanted to uh, look into that fast. And that was just because we had too many calls for this feature flag. And that uh, brought us to creating a new group of feature flags, which we call big features. These big features uh, are basically a feature flags wi which you need to enable for many actors. You, we don't have a clear cut, but if it's in hundreds, then you usually want to use big feature. Uh, yes. So let's talk about gates. As I mentioned, we use Flipper. And Flipper uses this uh, notion of gates to decide if the feature flag is enabled for a specific actor. Do you remember this, how we can enable the feature flag? So we can either enable or disable it. That means it's enabled or disabled for everyone. We can enable it for specific actors, group, or percentages of users of time. And that's the same how the gate operates. So the feature key is the name of my feature. In this case, uh, they're implementing some new statistics, right? The key now is the Boolean. So that's the first part. If you want to either enable or the disable feature flag for everyone. And then the value for the Boolean, it's easy. It's true or false. Then you have feature flags where the key is groups. This is when you are enabling the feature flag for a specific set of actors. In this case, the value may be admins, it may be early access, it may be staff. Yes, so this is the example with the early access. And then for each actor, there will be also gate created. So now we have key actors, and then we have ID of that actor. So you see that if you need to enable feature flag for individual actors, uh, you need to create gate for each of them, or like the gates will be created for each of them. Then you have one for percentage of time, where the value is the percentage of time, and the same way it, way, uh, it works for the percentage of actors. You get it right. So the difference between the regular feature and the big feature is that for the regular feature, we cache and query uh, all, the, all the gates for actors, for groups, for percentage users, and for percentage of times. But for the big features, we don't preload uh, the actors. We preload just all the groups, feature flags, and non-user non -user gates. And then if we have a user, we make separately the request for that specific user, then we query it, then we can cache it. So of course, this, number, this increases number of reads but in the database and number of the keys in memcache. However, overall, we don't have to iterate over really long uh, keys 
in the case that we have many actors enabled. So, <laughs> um, what we can do is that we can see the amount of, oh yeah, um, on our, sorry, on our pages we can check all this information. So if I load, for example, a pull request view, I can see what is the amount of a feature flags which is used on this specific page, how many of them are enabled and how many of them are disabled. I can also see uh, the amount of calls for every specific feature flag, and I can check the length of all these calls taken together. Uh, I can see which features are preloaded and if there are any big features. So when I was preparing this presentation and I was looking at one of our pages, on that single page we had 95 feature flags and 58 from them were enabled. We did 357 calls in 68 milliseconds just for one single page and one single view. So that's why it is important to think about, okay, what happens if we want to use feature flags at scale? Of course, every company is different, and you're sh welcomed, and you also should think about what works for your case and how to use what you heard. I would hope you uh, learned some interesting things you can try, but it's uh, always on you to make what makes sense. So with that, I'd like to say happy feature flagging. And um, I have two more things. One is, as we already heard about many great conferences taking place in Europe, I just want to uh, say that there will be also one in Switzerland. It's the first, first year we organized that, me and two other people. And so it will be in November. If you want to do something fun before Christmas, you're Welcome. Uh, we will be happy to have you. My second ask is if you can take out your phones now, scan this QR code, and there are just three or four super short questions, because I would love to hear your feedback. I'll leave it here, just for a second. And with that, I would really want to thank you for your attention, and let's stay in touch. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>